Proverbs 23, 29 says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They've stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They've beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, the reading of your word and the preaching to follow. Lord, there has been such a sweet and tender spirit in this place tonight, and I've no doubt you've done that not just to encourage and help us, but to prepare us for the topic to come, one that every heart's going to need to be open to receive. So I pray you'd give me the right words, and may I get everything just right from your word, and would you do your perfect work in every heart and life tonight. These things I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Some months ago, we began to discuss the topic of for such a time as this from the famous passage in the book of Esther. And we've looked at a variety of different times that people will come to. Uh, From our text in Proverbs tonight, I want to cover a time of intemperance. Now, let me begin, please, by defining a couple of words. Both the words temperance and intemperance have dual meanings. A temperance can either mean self-control in general or self-control in the area of alcohol in particular. Intemperance can mean either a lack of self-control in general or a lack of self-control in the area of alcohol in particular. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, temperance societies sprung up promoting total abstinence from alcohol consumption. So when I use the title, A Time of Intemperance, I'm talking about the age in which we live and its propensity to approve of and even encourage the drinking of alcohol. And I'm talking about even a lot that call themselves Christians to do so. Now let me state some things up front. As far as I know, None of you drink alcohol. So I'm not preaching to you because I've heard something. So if you do drink alcohol and you don't like what I'm preaching tonight, you just smile and I won't know the difference and I won't know that it's you. Because if I do know that it's you, I'm probably coming down to where you're at to preach to you. I want to state unequivocally, that drinking alcohol in any amounts is sinful and stupid and dangerous. Let me say it again. Drinking alcohol in any amounts is sinful and stupid and dangerous. I've seen how Scripture speaks about it. I've seen the devastation it has wrought in countless lives and homes. And I will never back down from saying that drinking alcohol in any amounts is sinful and stupid and dangerous. Back when the Methodist Church still had some God about them, their fiery evangelist Sam Jones used to say, I will fight whiskey until perdition freezes over and then I will fight it on the ice. Robert Ingersoll, a noted agnostic, said alcohol is God's biggest enemy and the devil's best friend. People used to have the sense to know that it was dangerous, sinful, and stupid and that people ought to stay away from it. Now right up front, Let me state that I do not believe for a moment that Christ either made or drank alcoholic wine. If I'm wrong, he'll doubtless correct me when I get to heaven, and I'll apologize. But based on everything I see in Scripture, I I do not think I am in the least wrong on this. But stop and think of this, please, because I want to rip the rug right out from underneath everybody that uses this foolish argument, and I want to rip it out of the rug, out from under them so hard and so quick that they'll stop standing in such a stupid place. I want you to think about something. Even if it were very clear that Christ had made and drank alcoholic wine, may I remind you what should be obvious? You're not him. He is perfect. Are you? He can't be tempted to sin. Can you? He can never become a drunk. Can you? 
He could never take it too far. Can you? You, you see where I'm going with this? He can't be tempted, but you can. He could never become a drunk, but you can. He can never take it too far, but you can. So if you believe that Jesus made and consumed alcoholic wine, just be sure that you never drink it until you are as perfect as he is. And since you'll never be as perfect as he is, never drink it. And furthermore, Christ also did a few other notable things that I don't hear much about. It amazes me, Brother Chip, that the crowd who believes that Christ's example gives them the right to drink alcohol sort of stops with that example. May I remind you that he also fasted 40 days and 40 nights, neither eating nor drinking? Gets real quiet right there. Because I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, you know what? We get to fast 40 days and 40 nights because Jesus did it. So because he did it, we get to do it. I never hear him say that. Seems like the only example they want to follow is the one that indulges their flesh rather than the one that crucifies their flesh. I remember in Luke reading that Jesus continued all night in prayer to God. But Brother Ford, I've never heard this crowd say, because Jesus prayed all night, we need to go pray all night. See, they don't do that. That would be crucifying the flesh. They're not interested in crucifying the flesh. They're interested in indulging their flesh. So with that established, I want to begin to look at how dangerous alcohol really is. And I want to start by establishing an understanding of how prevalent it is these days. And then I want to get into our text and look at what the Word of God says about it. You know, we're here in, in a Bible-believing church in the middle of a, a bunch of people who have mostly been raised in church. Even, the, even most of the public schools still have Bible clubs, see you at the poll day, a lot of saved teachers. If there's anything we don't need to preach and teach on, it's alcohol, right? Wrong. Even among good kids and adults, it's not, it's not as nearly as, as unheard of a thing as you can imagine. Alcohol is a problem the size of a dinosaur. In the local high school where most of our kids go, students have been getting falling down drunk for years. As far back as 1987, I knew many students in the high school right down the road who went out in a huge group every single weekend and got falling down drunk. I'm talking about 16, 17, and 18-year-olds. I'm talking about kids who went to church. I'm talking about kids who had deacons for dads. Don't tell me alcohol isn't a problem because I promise you it hasn't gotten any better in the last 30 years. In fact, it's gotten a whole lot worse. One of my favorite stories is from CNN on May 5th, 2000. Woman says alcohol prompted robbery with golf club. Here it is. Betty Lou, Lou Doss was teed off, so to speak. Now, that's no excuse for robbing a post office using a golf club as a weapon, a judge has decided. Doss, 34 of Green Forest, has pleaded guilty to robbery and was sentenced Wednesday to 10 years in prison. Doss says her outburst was due to alcohol. Quote, this is a story about me drinking and my number three driver. Okay, only in Arkansas do you get a headline that says that. This is about me drinking and my number three driver, Doss told Washington County Circuit Judge William Story. The Johnson Post Office had just closed when Doss arrived and found the door locked one day last month. Doss said she then returned to her station wagon and retrieved a golf club, hitting the window of the post office six or seven times. She reached through the shattered window to unlock the door, then threatened a female customer and clerk with her club. Police said she took the customer's purse as she fled. Here's another one, alcohol, kids' drug of choice. Washington Post Online, May 27, 2000. Recent tragedies such as the death of a 20-year-old Georgetown student following a drunken fight have opened many parents' eyes to the problem of binge drinking on college campuses. But too many parents fail to realize that excessive drinking often begins much earlier. Alcohol is the drug of choice among high school and middle school students today. You hearing that? And while one-third, 33% of high school students say they've binged on alcohol in the last month, a Peter Hart poll found that just 3% of high school students' parents think that their kids have done so. According to a recent drug studies report, Millennium Hangover, regular drinking among teens surpasses regular use of all illicit drugs combined, and teens are getting drunk more often than in the past. As far back as 1998, one in three high school seniors reported being drunk in the preceding month, up 13% since 1993. We're talking about children. Here's one. Headline, Most Russian Men Die Drunk. Friday, May 19, 2000. 
Two-thirds of Russian men die drunk, and more than half of that number die in the extreme stages of alcoholic intoxication. The Daily Commerçant newspaper quoted a report as saying on Friday, quote, everyone is drunk. Murderers and their victims, drowning victims, suicide, victims of heart attacks and ulcers, the paper said in the commentary on the story. Some of these news accounts are from a long way back. Have you noticed this? And it's only gotten worse since then. It would be a lot better if this world, this nation, this country just observed what God had to say about this wicked stuff called booze. So let's start by looking at our text, Proverbs 23, 29 through 35. Notice what it gives us as the consequences of drinking. First of all, those who get into alcohol will end up with woe. Proverbs 23, 29, who hath woe? Woe is from a Hebrew word that means weeping, wailing, lamentation as at a funeral. You know as well as I do, that is a perfect description of what alcohol causes. It causes woe. Many years back, you've heard me tell the account, Brother Chip and I heard of a party going on in Bowling Springs, North Carolina. We went down to where it was, got out of the car, and I just pulled out a Bible and started preaching out loud. It was like, I mean, I mean, cockroaches scattering of light. <laughs> People could not get out of there fast enough. And about the time most of them got out, there were just a handful of them left. And Brother Chip and I stood there witnessing to them on the porch. And a 15-year-old girl came to know Jesus Christ as her Savior. She was in church for a good number of months, got away from the alcohol, got away from that crowd. And then Miss Casey started missing. And we started trying to find out where she was and found out she was going back to the old crowd and going back to the old life. And we contacted her and said, you can't do that. God brought you out of that. There's going to be a price to pay if you go back into it. Please do not go back into that. If you Weeks later, her grandmother called us in the middle of the night on a Saturday night screaming, She's dead! She's dead, preacher! She's dead! She'd gotten back around the old crowd, started drinking, around, drinking again, drowning in her own vomit. I'm telling you, those who get into alcohol end up with woe. It's just what happens. Number two, those who get an alcohol will end up with sorrow. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? And this particular word for sorrow means to be sorry because you do not have what you desire. Now, I've said this many times. I know you understand it. God bless you if you like it, but I hate country music. I hate it mostly because if I needed a reason to be depressed, I could find some better way to do it than to listen to that. Why do you want to listen to something where everything goes wrong all the time and it's always raining? I don't understand that. We met a guy years ago through the church here that was a living, breathing country western song. I will call him Bubba, just for the sake of stereotyping, I suppose. Uh, Bubba had lost, and I'll give you the list, he had lost his single wide, his pickup truck, his wife, his children, his guitar, and his dog. Okay, you don't get a more perfect country western song than that. He lost it all. And he lost it because he put the bottle to his lips and became a drunk. Had he never put the bottle to his lips, he'd have never lost everything he lost. He'd have never had to whine and be sorrowful the way that he was. Those who get into alcohol will end up with sorrow. Number three, those who get into alcohol will end up with contentions. Uh, Verse 29, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions. That word contentions means fighting and arguing. This is where sipping that first little bit of alcohol will lead you. I've done more than 25 years of marriage counseling. I have heard husbands and wives scream bloody murder at each other and call each other things that never ought to be said to one another in a home or any context, and it always centered around somebody having put a bottle to their lips. If you want a life where there's fighting and contention and strife, putting alcohol to your lips is a surefire way to make it happen. Those who get an alcohol will end up with contention. Number four, those who get an alcohol will end up with babbling. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Babbling basically means speech that does not make a lick of sense. Now, I assume you can tell by looking at social media and other things today that the American populace is not getting any more intelligent as the years go by. Have you noticed that? Uh, The IQ is not exactly skyrocketing among our citizenry. I said that to say this, people are dumb enough on their own without having to put the bottle to their lips. 
You take dumb and add alcohol to it, you get something way, way worse than dumb. You get somebody that ends up as an absolute babbler. Have you ever noticed how it's not really hard to tell who's drinking and who's not based on how they talk? Yeah. Two examples. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Number two. Whoo-wee! Me gonna sum a hum whooping you, you dog, you ain't got no chance, dog. Hmm? <laughs> Do you really have trouble? Telling who's been drinking, drunks sound really stupid. The first time you put liquor to your lips, you are literally destroying the cells in your brain. Alcohol will leave you making as much sense as Barney the dinosaur crossed the crazed parrot. I probably would love you. I probably would love me. I we're a pirate family. Say, preacher, you're being ridiculous. That's exactly what you're heading for if you put alcohol to your lips. Those who get into alcohol, number five, will have wounds without cause. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? This means that when you get into drinking, bad things happen that did not have to happen. It is not necessary for you to kill somebody with your driving, but it's a wound without cause that often happens when people drink. It's not necessary for you to get into fights with people at a bar or a party, but it's a wound without cause that often happens when you drink. It's not necessary for you to lose your job, home, or car and end up on the street shivering in a gutter night after night, but it's a wound without cause that often happens when you drink. Alcohol makes bad things happen that never needed to happen. Bubba, whom I mentioned earlier, we tried to help him for months. Saturday night at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's amazing how the devil always times things for the worst possible time, especially from a preacher's perspective. Trying to get some sleep and be ready for the next morning. Sunday, got to be there ready, ready, bright-eyed, bushy tail to preach on Sunday morning. 2 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. Bubba's on the other end with slurred speech going, Preacher, if I kill myself, will I go to hell? I know better than to answer that question for falling down drunk, so I just distracted him. We talked about everything in the world for about a half hour, and finally I heard him snoring on the other end. And I hung up and went to bed. Next Saturday night, 2 o'clock in the morning. Preacher, if I kill myself, will I go to hell? I'm not answering that question for drunk, so I just talked about everything in the world, distracted him. About a half hour later, I heard him snoring. I hung up the phone. Next Saturday night, Two o'clock in the morning, like he's set an alarm clock for it. Ring. Preacher! If I kill myself, will I go to hell? I'm not going to discuss that with a drunk. I just talked about everything in the world, fuming, getting madder by the moment, but not letting him know that. Finally, I heard him snoring on the other end. I hung up the phone. I told my wife, if he calls back next Saturday at two o'clock in the morning, I'm going to tell him, you'll fry like a tater tot in the hottest part of hell forever! I didn't believe it, but I was mad enough to about say it. Well, he didn't call next Saturday at 2 o'clock in the morning. He waited till 4 o'clock in the morning. And this time, he just said, I did it, preacher. I'm sorry, click. So I try to call him back. I get nothing but the busy tone on the other end. I called 911, gave him his address, got up and got dressed. 4 o'clock in the morning, drove 45 minutes to the moron's house. The ambulance was already there. The paramedics and EMTs were already there. Lights flashing all over the yard. I got out of the car. One of the paramedics recognized me, came over and said, Preacher, we got a problem. He's going to live. He was drunk and then took a bunch of sleeping pills, but if we don't get him to the hospital and get him cleaned out, it could do some serious damage to his internal organs. But the problem is he's being a stubborn drunk and won't get in the vehicle. I said, let me talk to you. So I went to where he was, and I said, Bubba, here's the situation. If you don't get in the back of the ambulance, you're going to die because I'm going to kill you. He got in the back of the ambulance, went to the hospital. A little while later, I'm sitting there outside his room. Not going to get any sleep that night. Just going to go straight to church. I'm sitting outside his room. His mom's sitting beside me outside the room, and I hear him being the ornery drunk that he is, coming down off at all he's been on. He's, he's arguing and fussing with the nurses inside the room. 
They're trying to get him to pee inside the little cup thing. And he is being ornery. Y'all not going to do it. I ain't going to do it. You can't make me do it. I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. Little, little nurse about yay big comes storming out of the room as mad as a wet hen. Storms off down the hall. And a minute later I hear. <laughs> and this gigantic lady nurse is coming down the hall. And you can almost hear her saying, I love my job. I love my job. <laughs> and she is carrying what I recognize to be the catheter in the little thing right there. And she stormed inside the room, and I could hear him saying, I ain't going to do it. I gotta, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm too late, Jack. You ever tried not to, to, to laugh hysterically when sitting beside somebody's mom outside the hall of a hospital? I was really struggling that night to maintain my pastoral poker face. He got all that trouble and all those wounds. He didn't have to go through any of it. If it had the sense not to put bottle to his lips he wouldn't have had to go through it wounds without cause those who get into alcohol will end up with redness of eyes Proverbs 23 29 who hath woe who hath sorrow who hath contentions who hath babbling who hath wounds without cause who hath redness of eyes it's hard to imagine an ugly eye color Brown eyes are beautiful, green eyes are beautiful, blue eyes are beautiful, but there's at least one color of eye that's pretty, pretty ugly, and that's that sickly bloodshot red that alcohol turns them. Drinking alcohol is not just damaging to the appearance of the eye. It can literally damage the eye long term. It can cause blurred vision, lack of insensitivity when seeing color, increased sensitivity to light, and difficulty seeing at night. A number of studies link increased risk of cataracts to high levels of alcohol consumption. Excessive alcohol consumption can slow down the pupil's reaction time. Pupils won't be able to dilate or constrict appropriately in responses to changing light conditions. In this situation, your ability to see colors and shades becomes impeded and as Solomon noted one of the physical characteristics of someone who's a drinker is bloodshot eyes the change in appearance is due to alcohol abuse swelling the tiny blood vessels in the eyes enlarging their appearance and making the eyeball look red simply put drinking takes a toll on your eye health number seven those who get into alcohol will find out that it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder verse 32 at the last at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Please notice this happens when? At the last. When you first get into alcohol, it may seem so cool. Everybody thinks you're really something. You may, you may enjoy the little buzz. Moses said there's pleasure in sin for a season. That initial pleasure is what Miller Light and Heineken and Coors and Budweiser love to show you on all their ads. Good-looking guys and girls hanging all over each other, loud music playing, people wearing fancy clothes and going expensive places. But here's what they won't show you. They won't show you the homeless shelter in Uptown Shelby where I've seen 30 men, women, and children crowded onto cots in a room about the size of our back room for month after month after month, eating soup every meal, stinking like vomit, wearing the same clothes every day for weeks that look older than they really are. They can't seem to find people then to hang all over them, don't get invited to parties then, even their families don't want to be around them anymore. That's where booze will take you because of the last it bites like a snake. Number eight, those guys who get into alcohol will end up with her eyes beholding strange women. Verse 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women. Let me be as kind as I can be. I have seen some of the girls that drunk guys have slept with. And all I can say is that they had to be so drunk they were in a coma if they thought that was a good idea. Guys, when you're sober, you'll most likely have good enough sense not to get around a wicked girl, a married girl, or an excessively ugly girl. But if you get into alcohol, all those things will happen. And girls, the same thing's true for you. If you get into booze, you will end up with a guy that makes you wish you weren't even living. You listen to me. I have seen very few girls who drank that did not end up with a guy who beat them. Very few. That's just one more benefit of drinking. Number nine, those who get into alcohol will talk filthy. Verse 33 again, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You want to know who talks filthier than anybody on earth? A drunk. They'll talk filthy to men, women, kids, senior citizens, even preachers. 
Worst cursings I've ever gotten. Thanks. I appreciate y'all recommending them to call me. But, but the wor 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 worst cursings I've ever gotten were from drunks. That folks said, here, come up, preacher, and talk to them. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Some of the worst things you'll ever hear were coming out of the mouth of a drunk. That's why nobody likes a drunk. Number 10, those who get into alcohol will behave as if they are invincible when they're not. Verse 34, yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. If you're in the middle of the sea, what should you be doing? Swimming for dear life. If you're way up on top of a ship's mast, what should you be doing? Hanging on for dear life. But a drunk doesn't have enough sense to realize the trouble he's in. He thinks he's invincible. This is why drunks end up mouthing off at people twice their size and three times as mean and getting stabbed or shot in the process. Those who get into alcohol behave as they're, if they're invincible. Lastly, those who get into alcohol, even when they finally realize how much damage it's done, will keep going back to it. Look at verse 35. They've stricken me, shall thou say, and I was not sick. They've beaten me. And I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. It's a good definition of addiction. This guy talks about how he got beat up while he was drunk and was so drunk he didn't even feel it till he sobered up. He wakes up with cracked ribs, teeth busted out, black eyes, a broken nose, hurting all over. You'd think he'd say, this is awful, I quit. But instead he says, I'm going to sleep it off and go do it again. You listen to me. Alcoholic drinks are designed by the manufacturer to be addictive. If it wasn't addictive, there wouldn't be any such thing as a drunk. That's why God gave us this instruction in the text. Look at verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. You see what he told you not to do? Don't even what? Look at it. The particular color of redness spoken of here meant that the wine was now fermented, alcoholic. Unlike other wine in the Bible that was simply non-fermented grape juice or wine mixed multiple parts water to one part wine, thus having no alcohol content at all, God told us not to even look at it lest we be tempted by it. Don't even be friends with those who drink. Don't even think about going to spring break where people drink. Don't think about asking your parents if you can go to grad week at the beach where everybody's there for exactly two things, booze and sex. Alcohol is deadly. Don't even look at it. You hear all the time, friends don't let friends drink and drive. No friends don't let friends drink, period. You hear all the time, drink responsibly. The truth is every single drop of alcohol you put on your lips is irresponsible. Listen to me very carefully. First, First Thessalonians 5.22 says abstain from all appearance of evil. It violates every principle of Scripture, including that one. You look evil when you do it because people know what you are drinking. Romans 13.14, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Don't even be around it because you're giving yourself a chance to do wrong. One last thought to leave with you. Some years ago, back when we lived out in Pokal, in the little house up there, they was a, there was a decent snow that year, and um, I was out walking in the snow out in front of our house. It's probably 18 inches deep or so. I heard a little sound behind me, and I looked behind me, and I saw Karis, who stood about this big at the time, and she was going. I looked back at her and I said, Baby, what are you doing? And she said, Daddy. I'm just walking in your footsteps. And I reached down and picked her up and I hugged her. And I said, baby, I hope you can always do so safely. She said, what do you mean, Daddy? I said, you won't understand now. I'll explain it one day. You listen to me. Even if you could drink it and handle it, which you can't, when you put it to your lips, others will be emboldened to put it to their lips. There is no scripture, no logic, no paradigm at all in which it is anything less than sinful and stupid and dangerous to put alcohol to your lips. Don't ever touch.